here we are again. It's been a little while since I last did you um, a series of reviews. So I have seven books up for you today and um, I hope that some of them, all of them, one of them, um, whets your appetite. Um, I often, people often say to me, how do you manage to read so many books? And the thing is, believe it or not, I cannot read them all. So I will start today with a book or two that, no, I haven't read, ha, <laughs> but um, Laura has read this one and she has given us a little review. Now it's called Here Goes Nothing by Steve Toltz and it comes to us from Hamish Hamilton, which is um, Penguin Random House. And, I mean, it isn't, but it's an imprint of. This, um, Steve Toltz, I didn't realize was an Australian writer. I am terribly sorry, Steve Toltz. Um, but I had definitely heard of a uh, fraction of the whole, which was a Booker Prize shortlist in 2008. So we know we are in the hands of um, a master. Laura's review of this, and I will read it for you, says, um, ha -ha, little notes, um, this is the quirkiest book I have ever read. It's weird, wacky and wonderful. It's truly unique and entertaining. It made me question life, death and everything in between. Now there's an endorsement. Um, we know more or less what we're, we're going to get from, well we don't know because I haven't told you anything really yet. So what I know about it having asked is that it's um, basically told from the point of view of someone called Angus Mooney. I do like that name Mooney, very Irish. And um, he's a bit of a shady character, you know, sort of petty criminal and maybe more. Um, and he has met Gracie, who is a bit of a, um, uh, you know, a love the whole world type person, believing in sort of energies and woo what we call woo-woo. Um, officiates at weddings and is generally compassionate and into humanity in a big way. And he starts, Angus, when he meets this love of his life, he starts to... Um, you know, clean up his act a bit. Things all look very good until the day that Angus dies. Now, I can't really tell you any more about that. All I can tell you is that um, death is not the end. And that's what the whole book is about. Um, it's about the, you know, are we, where, what are we on the way towards? Um, and I think we do uh, get this idea of Angus, um, I, I think I can tell you this because I think it's on the blurb on the back anyway, Angus looking down on life as it's unfolding while he's hovering in the ether um, and uh, quirky, funny, full of philosophy, make you think and make you. It's meant to be hilarious. Laura definitely found it very funny. Um, so there's a good one to keep uh, in mind for a thinking but clever funny read. Ah, yes, godlessness and all of that stuff. Great laugh. How about the next one up again? Now, this is one of those ones, and you and I will have another little ha-ha chuckle because we're, you are all in on this joke. Sea of Tranquility, Emily St. John Mandel. This comes to us from Picador, and you may have read Station Eleven or The Glass House, which was her most recent. I think this is her fifth or sixth, sixth novel. Um... So David is reading, or was reading this one, and very early in, I um, he let out this groan, and I said, oh God, you know, it can't be bad, it's her, it cannot be bad. And he said, no, but is this going to be short stories? And I, you know, I should look at you, or look at him with a kind of literary highbrow frown and say, and what's wrong with short stories? And his answer was, well, I like to choose to read short stories and I don't like to be duped into thinking it's a novel and then I find out it's short stories and this is something I have had, you know, have had echoed from other readers. So um, I said read on, read on, be brave and read on indeed he did and was it worth the, um, uh, the, the sacrifice? Absolutely. So it's um, you and I, whoever you are, <laughs> have talked before about the um, the two novels that I, I reviewed not so long ago, uh, Jennifer Egan's um, Candy House and Sequoia Nagamatsu's uh, How High We Go in the Dark, both absolutely stunning books that work on this structure of interconnected stories. And I said, I asked David, is this the same thing? Is it this kind of interconnected? And he said, well, yes and no. That helps us a lot, doesn't it? Um, we are in 
several timelines in this one um, and we start in Vancouver in 1912 and then we move to 2020 then sometime in 22,000 and sometime in 24,000 there's a moon colony there's um, you know the different sort of um, cultures and ways of living there are and I think all of our speculative, because this is sort of projecting into into an unknown future, the aftermath of of um, virus of some you know pandemic related to our now, but obviously projected into what that might do to our future, which is the reason that we read speculative fiction. Come on, guys. Um, this one at the end, David said. Um, that he felt that looking back over the, the, the this series of books that are coming out now, which which mention what our future might look like and have these interconnecting, the Yig and the Nagamatsu, he said he felt that this one topped all of them, which is, um, I think, quite a recommendation because both the Jennifer Egan and the Nagamatsu were, for me, um, very thought-provoking um, reads, you know, with their, with their, um, their stronger and weaker bits to them but they were you know sections I think that um but he said this was consistently good I think it's been touted more as a time travel novel and I'm not sure that that's inaccurate either um one um friend of mine called it a a nesting structure which I think refers to the fact that the novel kind of then curls back in on itself so you get this sort of looping going on um David's uh I said, so, so give me, give me your, your sort of, you know, your, your selling line for this one. And instead of just saying, oh, it's great. We all know what he can be like. He did say, and I will read it to you. This is a sublime tale set in the nearish future and the distant past. There is not one word out of place. Now, as I said, this is very high high praise from from him indeed. And um, if David's going to say more than just it's great, he always means it when he says it's great. He is a man of few words. Um, but that one seems to have knocked his, his socks off. And it's um, one that I have now said, all right, I'm going to read this one. Ha. Ah. When am I going to get the time? I hear you all saying, and I don't know. I think I'll have to do something speculative with my life and get it all to loop in a strange way. Next one up, a little bit different. We have Abomination by Ashley Goldberg. This comes to, to us from Vintage. And boy, oh boy, um, this had me out of my... Probably, you know, it mightn't have been the first book I was going to pick up and this with every every apology to the author I mean I would love to be able to pick up every author's books and, and book and and um, give it as fair a go as as any other this is a debut author and boy am I very very glad I did pick it up because it is a fascinating insight into a world about which I know very very little I know something but not a lot and I relearned some of the things I thought I knew we are in Melbourne and we are, I suppose, following the lives of two young men, Ezra and uh, Jonathan, and they are both um, have been schooled in an exclusive um, Orthodox Jewish um, school. And um, it's about the separation of the ways. It's about how life um, and what happens um, might send you in one direction or through intervention of events as in this one there is a rabbi in this school who is uh, accused of um sexual abuse and the two families that these boys belong to deal with this in different ways so in Ezra's case he is removed sent to a different school and then he progresses into a more atheist secular life whereas um Jonathan is is kept in the school and um his life then takes a different path. I suppose I knew very little about the kind of enclosed world of, of the Orthodox Jewish um, religion. I've read something about it, but I think it was very interesting to be given a, a look inside and, and um, to have a reveal on how it's just such an issue as, you know, you've sent your child to a school and there's a, a, a rabbi in there who has been accused of, of um, you know, bad behaviour or sexual um, uh, abuse of children, who deals with this? And how re religion intersects with the law of the land. And I found that, that a very interesting ethical 
um, dilemma for people of religion and for the law um, of a nation. Um, I suppose in a lot of ways this book is about being included in things and being excluded. It's a book about where the boundaries are. It's a book about binaries. I mean, in one way you could say that these two young men are, are almost two halves of the same person because there's that war, constant warring of personality of what it's like to do the things which are frowned on by your religion. And these two young men sort of in one way taste each other's lifestyles, their faiths, their freedoms, their particularly their sexual freedom. I think it's very much of an interesting book for learning about um, male perspective on, you know, how faith might affect the, your sexual partnerships, your, um, your loyalties, your rights um, as a male and those as a female or lack of them. Um, absolutely fascinating. It's word perfect. It's a very tight, um, very neatly written book that never swerves into um, hyperbole or into judgment. And I think that's the the its force is that in, in uh, as a debut novel, it, it's kept a very um, non-judgmental but very clear-eyed look at these two young men, moments of humour, um, but basically quite a serious book that takes itself seriously and is quite a serious subject and for that I, I applaud it. I thought it was a very, very, very educational but also very, very interesting read, so that's one to go for. Completely different feel now, we have, ha, huh, I've got one or two crime novels up here for you and goodness gracious me, they would knock your socks off, all right, I've got these in the wrong order. Goodness, now this was complex and very riveting. It's Shelley Bird's Wake, and it comes to us from Hachette. Um, what not to say, it's a, it's a winner of the CWA debut dagger. You can see that on it, so it's not like that knowledge was in here. I just read it off the cover, but I knew this. It's a great, um, it's a great debut novel, but it's just a great novel. We are set in a very small town in New South Wales, um, and this is very much a thing in our Australian writing, um, so you better get used to it because there will be more of it, and each one is unique in its own way. We can say there's the setting, this is what she does with the setting. We're looking at a, a cold case, if you like. There were two sisters who were asleep in their, you know, they're the wealthy landowners, they were asleep in the same bedroom. One child goes missing at night, um, Evelyn and her sister is left behind and everybody sort of suspects that she must know something but she really doesn't know anything or does she and there's been a story out of the press. Now this case has never been solved, it's still an open case and we come into the story 19 years later where this um, young woman, um, Mina, is, is the, you know, the case is still ongoing and there's a reward. Um, she lives with her father, um, the property has sort of declined a lot, um, the mother has since, um, is no longer part of the picture and um, was a great campaigner for getting um, police um, to, to investigate this case, but it has gone, the trail is dead. And into this um, young woman, who's, who's living quite remotely, she's, she's not, uh, you know, she's because of all this constant sort of um, media interest in, in what is now a cold case, she she lives quite reclusively and into this comes Lane Holland, a private investigator who himself has, shall we say, other motives for wanting to be um, interested in this case and in other cases where there have been other missing young girls. He is guardian for his younger sister Linnea and you get to you get to learn that their father, their father was um, abusive. He is currently in prison and he's about to be released and you know that this might not be a great thing um, for anyone and for everyone. What I liked most about this, I think, was, I mean, I love the relationship between um, Holland and Evelyn and Evelyn's relationship with the world. I love this looking into memory um, and how it's faulty. Um, I think, you know, when you're dealing with cases of um, children who've been abducted, a lot of us feel like, oh God, I really don't want to read about this. But there's, because it's, she's cleverly set this in the past, kind of the freshness of that has been dulled for us. And we're really dealing with the, the sort of the aftermath and then 
can it ever be solved after this amount of time? Um, I thought it was very, very um, competently and imaginatively handled. A great read. It's gritty. It has a little bit of... of, of I don't want to say romance, but the human interest factor is huge in this, and she does it very well, and I love where she takes us to in this novel. Um, fascinating. A really good one from Shelley Burr. And another one um, that I have great things to, to, um, to tell you, or to say of, is Hayley Scrivener's Dirt Town, which is a very recent release, and this one is, um, comes to us from Macmillan. And this was another absolutely fabulous read. Again, um, it's not the, it is the small town, but it's not this remote outback town. It's a New South Wales kind of small town. And I think what stands out in this one, possibly, is her voice. I think in all of our um, narratives where you're, where you're trying to hear things from the point of view of, of, a, of a young person or of a, a child. So we're kind of in that 12 year old range. Things can very quickly derail um, and only a very competent author, I think, manages to hit the spot without sort of wobbling into over silly, over naughty, over thought. She gets it right. Um, and I think it's, it's one of its strongest features and also, um, what I very much loved about this is um, the use of a different voice that I haven't heard in a um, in a crime novel. So this is the kind of the voice of the children of of a small town, and it's a wee voice. Is their kind of letting us in on what what happens when the children are identifying as a wee as a one voice? What happens if one of their one of their um, number goes missing and it's another missing child we have Esther and Ronnie um, they're meant to be walking home from school you know 12 year olds walking home from school well there's a lot of sort of you know everybody knows everybody there's a lot of freedom and Ronnie comes home but um, Esther never does and there's another little boy Lewis who is a friend of theirs and at some point we find out that he you know, has seen Esther um, and it's not where he thought, but he can't tell anybody because of his own reasons for doing this. And I think it's one of those lovely things about um, writing children is their concerns and what, who can they tell what, to whom can they tell these things or why would you not tell your parents things? And there's a lot about what parents mean um, or what they are for children, what it's like to, to have a, a parents who don't listen and what it's like to have parents who don't care, who don't care, who are sort of remote. It, the whole parent-child thing is very, very well explored. And it is that feeling of in a town, a town is never the same when something happens in it. Like family is never the same when something dreadful happens to it. So we're looking at this kind of reshuffling of the, all the, the sort of the jigsaw puzzle pieces of a town when they've taken the piece of Esther out. Exceptionally well narrated, um, very complex. Um, we have a rather disabused, tired outsider detective who has to come in and, you know, fault of manpower and all of these things. She's left with this case. She's seen a lot. She knows that people hide dreadful things. So as we go through the story, she's kind of other cases and other stories get, get um, revealed, dealt with. Um, yeah, it's it's got an awful lot going on. It's complex. It's not, you know, that bleak and awful. It's a very surprising, um, surprisingly sort of compassionate read. Um, and again, I'll come back to what I think really was its standout um, feature, which is the voice of the, the children is sublimely well done. So that's, that's a... That's a humdinger from me. All right, we've got a very different read here. I've got two more which kind of change our... Well, I've gone back to the beginning, which is Emily Brugman's The Islands. Now, I have no idea where I put my thing. Um, I don't really need it because I've just put this one down. And um, this comes to us from Alan and Unwin. It's, it's been out for a couple, for maybe three or four months, but um, I never really got round to it. Love that cover. And then I said, yeah, I was... Um, encouraged to read it for various reasons and I, I thought right we'll give this one a go um, and I'm very glad I did um, because it's a very very lovely book. Um, it's set 
It starts in the 1950s, where a group of um, Finnish migrants come to a come to Western Australia off Geraldton, and there's an archipelago. I find that word very difficult to say because when you live in other countries and speak other language, languages, it's archipelago, and I'm going archi, and then go no, it's wrong, archipelago, and I think it's called the Abrolhos archipelago. Abrolhos. Anyway, these. Um, Finnish migrants come from poverty and they um, come over to these islands to make a you know on, on one of these schemes to bring workers to to the mining towns or to um, to Western Australia and they start um, cray fishing and there is a living to be made so they, they kind of they have seasons where they live on the islands and seasons where they um, move to back to town, or at least in the family that we're following. Um, there is Oni and there is Alva, who are married, and they have a daughter called Hilda. This, I think, um, the writing is exceptionally beautiful. The setting and the descriptive passages are beautiful. The use of um, some of the metaphors, because the you know that there's a um, there's been shipwrecked, like the Batavia had gone down off these shores. There are kind of always hints of where, um, what the history of the place had been, how people, how the people sheltered, how at one point one of the, the um, characters says, you know, this the island is built on bones, which is also about, it's, it's you know, very ancient history. Um, the, as I said, it, it's, it's the writing which really keeps you in there. And she, she has some absolutely gorgeous characters, but it turns out that it's based on Brugman's own personal family history. So if you, I picked it up as Australian historical fiction and then realized I was probably reading something that was a cross between a memoir and as someone said, like a social history. And for that alone, it is well worth the read. It's absolutely fascinating because it's a, docu it's a documented, um, life um, or you know of, of three generations um, of, of this one family um, gorgeously um, depicted um, very lovely I would if you're interested um, having a fiction entry into the history of Western Australia is um, I found very valuable and very much loved for those reasons and our last one up ho ho this was a book that um, yeah, it might not be for everyone, but um, and I don't mean that in a negative sense. It, it it's it's a very complex um, and deceptively simple read. This one, how about that? You can't do better than that, can you? Portrait of an Unknown Lady by Maria Gainza, and I think this one comes to us from Harvel Secker, which is Penguin, and it's translated by Thomas. Bunstead. Now he translated Optic Nerve, which she wrote. Um, uh, I don't know how many years ago, maybe three. Um, always writes, or the optic nerve as well. It was written about art, and this is this is a book for art lovers. Um, I found it the most fascinating read, um, but very different from just straight narrative, you know, A to B and ellipses, all of that thing. I I found this um, an extraordinary read, and because in one way she doesn't satisfy you straight away in terms of plot or what was the book about you, you sort of sit there and let it percolate for a while and I feel that a book that makes me do that um has its own merit it might not that's what I mean when it's not for everyone it might not satisfy in terms of what you what your expectations as a reader are when you pick a book up and you say oh my goodness this looks good and then you oh I didn't know they were going to do that and this book might do that for you, but I think it's always well worth plunging into something that's a little bit different and seeing, yeah, let's see, you know, just take me along for the ride. Let's have no expectations. In this one we have, it's set in Argentina and it's set, as I said, in the art world. We are um, looking at a, what well, it's, we're positioned, um, we'd see it through the eyes of a narrator who is, has come to Paris to write a kind of confession memoir about, about her life. She had been a um, an art, worked in the art valuations in in um, in Argentina in Buenos Aires, and she had been mentored by a certain sort of very secluded, living, wonderfully um, described uh, sort of grouchy, crotchety, and in no way um, stereotyped um, character who, at some point, it kind of initiates her into the 
the, the fact that nothing is ever really what it seems, even with artwork. So we're talking about provenance. And this uh, mentor um, sort of admits at some point that she knew that there were um, forgeries of a particular artist, Lydis, who, who were being done by someone who was actually amazingly good at this and was in her own right someone worth knowing and learning about. So our, when this mentor um, dies of natural causes, our young narrator then um, kind of slips into her shoes and ends up meeting, because she has been introduced to this sort of underworld, meeting this same um, group of people who, who are the, the trail, if you like, of how these artworks find their way into the hands of a valuer who will then certify it as, a, as authentic. So it's a story about authenticity. It's a story about this young woman saying, I wonder who this forger is. So this sets her off on a kind of a quest. And it's not a quest to bring her to justice. So what's the point? There you have it. It's about um, not going in straight lines. It's about curiosity and where that might take you. It's about art, culture, philosophy, musings. And in the long run, I think it's a sort of, it's a mosaic of sort of fragmented um, parts um, that everything is sort of made up of, of all sorts of things, whether they be authentic or forged. And what does being forged mean? Is it still not an artwork? So it's, it's about, it's elliptical, it's sort of elusive. Um, there's something tongue in cheek about this one. Um, and I just absolutely, immersed myself in it and just loved it. I thought it was an absolutely superb read. I think I've said everything. I think I've probably said too much. I like I like being landed in a space where um, what, what I think I was going to get, I don't always get. We might all have to learn to live with that quite soon on a completely moral level. Um, or, you know, sort of, this is how we live now. This is my pile. There isn't one that I didn't love on that. Um, and I love them all differently. They're like my children. <laughs> um, if you have enjoyed this video, it would be very nice if you if you hit the like button. And if you like listening to me waffling on, you could also subscribe. These are possible things. Um, in the meantime, keep reading and, you know, support your indie bookshop and come and get them. I will see you again soon. Bye-bye.